All right, I have 12 on the dot. So welcome to session four of the Yellow Book webinar series. Uh, my name is Chelsea Erickson and I'm here uh, representing Sikkage University. I'll be helping out with today's session and Megan Weber from our marketing team is also on the call to assist with all of your questions um, and any, any needs that you may have. Uh, today we are joined by Lindsay Fish and Jim Savio who will be our facilitators. Um, before I hand it over to them, I really quickly just wanted to go over CPE for today. So in order to receive CPE, you will need to respond to three poll questions. It doesn't matter if you don't get the correct answer for the poll questions. As long as you respond to all three, you'll be able to receive credit for today's session. Um, this will be through GoToWebinar, so you'll see them pop up um, and you'll be able to respond within the application or browser, whatever you're on. Um, if you have any questions, please use the question area. If you're not familiar with GoToWebinar, it looks like a little question in a chat box. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Lindsay and Jim. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, thanks everyone for attending today's session on capital assets. We'll try to make it as riveting as possible. Uh, I'm a partner here at Sikich uh, in our Naperville office. I've been with Sikich since 1995, actually, and uh, every year I've worked on uh, local government audits um, from the very start. So um, I uh, have some happy news. Uh, today we uh, adopted a new uh, puppy uh, about two days ago, so we're still getting acclimated to his uh, excitement. So I've kind of barricaded myself into the uh, office, so hopefully he doesn't barge in at any point, but uh, I, will, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he did. So. A um, lot of a uh, lot of changes um, uh, in capital assets from GASB 34 uh, up through GASB 51, um, 83, 94, 96, uh, 87. So been a lot, lot of changes in capital assets, especially in re in the recent past. So uh, definitely a, a topic um, that's uh, timely uh, for discussion. So. I will uh, turn it over to Lindsay uh, and she'll give a brief introduction uh, uh, herself and then she will start off the, uh, the presentation as well and then I'll come in uh, about halfway through. So, Lindsay? Sounds good, thanks Jim. I, I am kind of hoping the puppy does barge into your office because I wanna see it, so <laughs> fingers crossed here. Yeah, well, hey everyone, thank you great. for joining us this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you're at. My name is Lindsay Fish, I am a principal at Sikich. Um, been with the company since 2013. I've been working exclusively on governmental audits all year round, you know, collaborate with a variety of different municipalities, counties, community colleges, and school districts throughout the year. Um, without further ado, we'll just kind of jump in and, and get started here. So our session is on capital assets, so we thought it would make sense by uh, giving you a definition of capital assets. So. Capital assets are assets used in operations with an initial useful life greater than one year. This includes both tangible and intangible assets. Tangible assets include land, buildings, building improvements, vehicles, machinery, equipment, works of art, historical treasures, infrastructure, uh, long list there. Um, intangible assets include easements, software, water rights, mineral rights, um, as well as most recently, you know, our right to use leases as well as right to use SPEDAs. Assets that are acquired for the purpose of sale, such as like a foreclosure property, these do not qualify as capital assets. Assets acquired for economic development purposes may qualify as capital assets or investments depending on their intended use. So if you, you have an asset that's held for resale or to generate a profit, GASB statement number 72 classifies this as an investment. Um, the capitalization threshold determines which capital assets are actually capitalized and costs to include in a capital asset are generally all costs to acquire, construct, improve, or otherwise place an asset into service. I wish we could do a show of hands here for who was around during the implementation of GASB Statement 34. Um, I'll be the first to admit I've, I've been here for a while, but uh, this was before my time. Um, but GASB Statement 34 did there. give us a definition of infrastructure assets. 
Infrastructure encompasses long-lasting capital assets that are stationary and can be maintained for a significantly longer period compared to other types of capital assets. So these assets typically have a useful life of 30 to 50 years and include essential structures such as you know, roads, bridges, tunnels, drainage systems, water and sewer systems, dams and lighting systems. Um, before the implementation of GASB 34, reporting on infrastructure was not mandatory. However, after its implementations, you know, governments were required to go through various stages to um, restate their assets. Won't delve into too much details there, but want to make sure we did cover that definition of infrastructure assets. Last definition that we'll go over here um, before we dive in on things is the definition of intangible assets. So an intangible asset, um, the definition from GASB statement number 51 um, has three components. So lack of physical substance, non-financial in nature, and initial useful life greater than one year. So initial useful life greater than one year, that's a pretty straightforward uh, component there. Lack of physical substance. So an asset, it could be contained or in an item with physical substance. So for example, a thumb drive or a disk, in the case of a computer software, an asset also may be closely associated with another item that has physical substance. For example, you know the underlying land in the case of a right-of-way easement. So these modes of containment and associated items should not be considered when determining whether or not an asset lacks physical substance. And then non-financial nature. So an asset with non-financial nature is one that is not in a monetary form similar to cash and investment securities, and it re represents neither a claim or right to assets in a monetary form similar to receivables. Uh, the definition and scope of GASB 51 applies to all tangible assets except for a couple items here. So assets that meet the definition we just covered, but are acquired or created primarily for the purpose of obtaining an income or profit. So again, GASB number state, statement 72 classifies that as an investment and also goodwill created through a combination of another government entity. The next few slides provide just a high level overview of some of our you know, favorite, most recent GASB statements. So those are GASB statement 87 and GASB statement number 96. So as Jim mentioned, um, a lot of new standards recently that, that kind of changed a little bit what we were seeing for our capital asset reporting. Um, these new standards required us to add new right to use and tangible assets into our capital asset schedules. So GASB 87 first, this one um, was issued to aim to improve lease accounting and financial reporting. So the existing standards had been in effect for quite a while without review. FASB and the International Accounting Standards Board were conducting a joint project to update their lease standards. So um, we decided to update, you know, GASB decided to update their guidance as well. This allowed us to increase the comparability and usefulness of information and in theory, uh, reduce the complexity for preparers. So this GASB 87 was required to be implemented for the year end of June 30th, 2022 and thereafter. So by now I'm, I'm imagining everyone in this webinar has probably implemented this new standard and seen how these changes affect your financial statements. In addition to GASB st statement number 87, there was also GASB statement 96, which was recently issued and required to be implemented as well. Um, GASB statement number 96 covered subscription-based information technology arrangements or SPEDAs as I pronounce them. Um, so a SPEDA is defined as a contract that conveys control of the right to use another party's IT software. Um, this was required to be implemented for June 30th, 2023 year ends and thereafter. So again, I think most of us in the webinar today have probably already implemented the standard, or maybe you're in the process of implementing the standard, or maybe you just got done implementing the standard. So um, similar to GASB Statement 87, 96 was issued to improve accounting and financial reporting for subscription-based IT arrangements or SPEDAs. Um, the why behind this standard was to improve financial reporting by establishing a definition for a SPEDA and providing uniform guidance for accounting and financial reporting. So this just helped provide greater, you know, consistent and comparability among government's financial statements. So the starting point of capital assets here is a good capitalization policy. So a good working capital asset policy is really just critical to your government maintaining proper, proper control over your capital assets. All governments should have a good capital asset policy that's developed by staff and approved by your governing board. Um, there's a good number of policies out there as well. So feel free to ask you know, your auditor or your peers as well for examples of capital asset policies that you could take a look at. 
Um, so just keep in mind that non-accountants also may have a hand in implementing your accounting policy. So you might have other department heads or mechanics or someone of that nature um, helping draft your, uh, your policy. And that's why it's important to make sure you have definitions throughout your policy. So make sure that you're defining the type of capital assets covered, so tangible and intangible. <clears throat> Consider separate policies for certain capital assets of governmental activities versus your business type activities. So for example, you might want a different policy for your governmental activities versus your business type activities that may cover some sort of utility, you know, capital assets. Most policies in the past have focused only on capital assets that your government owns with more recent requirements to report those intangible assets, you know, acquired via a le lease as defined by 87 or 96. The policies need to address the intangible assets um, and just make sure that it does address the requirements to be reported separately from tangible capital assets. Costs to capitalize as a part of the capital asset will vary depending on whether the capital asset was purchased, constructed, or contributed. <clears throat> Another critical component of the policy is what is the threshold our government uses to capitalize assets? I have a note in our slides, I think it maybe was you know, from when Fred or Jim had done this presentation a few years back, and it was that the state of Missouri used to use $50 as their capitalization threshold. I, I cannot even imagine using that as your threshold. You'd have to have 10 full-time accountants to keep track of your capital asset records, but <laughs> I'm told that, that that one has been updated since then, but just thought that was an interesting fact there. I will mention that GFOA does recommend $5,000 as your threshold um, and also different thresholds for different classes of capital assets is common as well. So you might have, you know, a $0 threshold for land, any land is capitalized, and then you might have, you know, a $10,000 threshold for office equipment, $50,000 for building improvements, $100,000 for infrastructure, and so on. So just want to make sure that your policy also addresses whether the threshold is applied on an individual basis to assets or on a group basis to assets as well. So again, just important to make sure all those components are included there within your policy. There's a few other things that we think should also be included within your policy to be addressed. So as a starting point when drafting your capital asset policy, or maybe just even if you're reviewing it, if it hasn't been updated recently, here are a key, few key points to look at. <coughs> classes of capital assets. Focus on reporting requirements for display on the pages of the financial statements, as well as in the notes to financial statements when developing the classes of assets. And further break down by subclasses of capital assets. Separate classes of assets by depreciable versus non-depreciable. We can also take this one step further by distinguishing depreciable versus amortizable assets as well. And estimated useful lives should be categorized by asset class and subclass. <laughs> Excuse me. Depreciation methods. Since there are no tax implications for our governments, most depreciation methods are straight line. However, there are several other depreciation methods out there that we're going to cover later on in the presentation. Reporting for capital assets. Again, we kind of discovered, uh, discussed reporting governmental activities versus business type activities. Um, and separately for funds and opinion units. So the same policy might not work for your water fund as what works for your golf course fund. Responsibility for custody. This is usually missing for most policies, but is critical for long-term success. Procedures for disposal. The most common issue that we see is that we keep capitalizing assets, but we're not removing any assets that are disposed of. So especially, you know, waters or sewer lines, so ensuring that you have a policy in place to ensure that you're disposing assets when they're no longer being utilized. Frequency of inventory. Consider how often inventory should occur and for which classes of assets. It's probably not necessary to conduct annual inventories for buildings, but it may be necessary for equipment. And then required departmental reporting. Just ensure your policy addresses required departmental reporting and that you have, you know, departments are aware of their role as far as tracking additions, disposals, and transfers. <coughs> Excuse me. Other items that I believe should be included, um, but are often overlooked, are capital assets acquired through non-traditional means. These often fall through the cra cracks. Examples include annexation agreements. Are you annexing existing infrastructure, which then becomes your infrastructure? Jurisdictional transfers between governments. 
especially counties and townships, involve the transfer of ownership and maintenance responsibility from one government to another. And due to your capitalization threshold, your government utilized, you might have some capital assets that you know aren't capitalized. They're not maintained on your listing because they fall below your capitalization threshold. You may want to consider how you're going to account for these assets for insurance purposes as well, if they're not included on your capital asset schedule. If you make a change to your capitalization policy, just remember that the change in accounting policies flow through the current period, while changes in accounting principles require beginning of year restatement. Now we're gonna move on from our capitalization policy and talk about how to record the acquisition of a capital asset. Purchased, leased, or constructed capital assets are recorded as an expenditure in governmental funds when acquired at the inception of your lease or as construction or as constructed. These costs are capitalized in the governmental activities, but never in a governmental fund. So again, remember that's an expense in your governmental fund, and then we convert to our government-wide statements. Those are then capitalized. Similar for contributed assets, such as you know developer um, con contributions or jurisdictional transfers, these are valued at acquisition value and are recorded as revenue, again, in your governmental activities. Again, revenue is not in your fund, but in your governmental activities. Now, this is different than our proprietary and fiduciary funds. So purchased, leased, or constructed capital assets are capitalized in our proprietary and fiduciary funds when acquired at the inception of a lease or as constructed. So you may run into a situation if you have proprietary and fiduciary funds where you still budget for capital outlay. In this case, you might show them as an expense in your financial statements and then have a contra account that shows up um, to show how these are then capitalized into assets. <clears throat> Contributed assets are reported as revenue in the proprietary and fiduciary funds, um, and this is generally classified as capital grants and contributions. So when is capitalization not required? Capitalization is not required for older infrastructure acquired before July 1980, as well as for collections of art and historical treasures under certain conditions. Uh, depending on your capital asset policy and capitalization threshold, items that are in individually immaterial may not be required to be capitalized as well. One is depreciation or amortization not required. So depreciation or amortization is not required for capital assets with indefinite useful lives, such as land and historical treasures. Additionally, infrastructure assets accounted for using the modified approach under GASB 34 also do not require depreciation or amortization. And then furthermore, we do not start recording depreciation for construction and progress until the asset has been completed and placed into service. So in this you know, somewhat rare scenario, what happens when a capital asset is associated with more than one government? Who, who reports this capital asset on their financial statements? For example, you know, if there's a bridge that spans between two separate municipalities, who reports that bridge within their financial statements? Um, first step is looking at ownership. Ownership is the main criteria we look at here. Legal title you know, is sufficient to establish ownership, but if ownership cannot be determined, um, it's important to consider who is responsible for maintaining the asset. So if you can't determine ownership, we'll look at, you know, look in the manner of who maintains the asset to determine who should be reporting that on their financial statements. The financial statements and accompanying notes should clearly display the major asset classes along with changes in accumulated depreciation for each asset class. Um, GASB 87 and 96 also mandated some separate reporting of intangible capital assets as well. So for example, assets like buildings that we own are gonna be classified, classified separately from those you know, right to use assets as well. It's important to note that governmental fund types and enterprise fund types may have different classes of capital assets, um, but we're gonna go over a few major asset classes. So land is always reported as its own separate class. We're gonna include all costs um, that include in that indefinite useful life that will not be depreciated. Construction and progress is also reported in its own class and again, is not depreciated. Buildings, um, you know, we add the cost of any buildings that we've purchased as well as any costs that increase the service utility of the building or extend that building's useful life. Um, this is depreciated. 
improvements other than buildings. These have useful lives less than buildings themselves. A few examples of improvements other than buildings would be like parking lots or HVA systems. Again, these are depreciated. Furnishings and equipment, as well as mobile equipment, are generally movable items that are capitalized and are depreciated. Infrastructure, again, is reported separate from land and building. And then we have our leased assets that are, in, are intangible and classified separately in accordance with Gadsby's number 87 and 96. Uh, from there, that lands us at our first polling question, if you can read that one out, Jim. Sure. Um... Depreciation amortization is required for which of the following asset types? Construction in progress, capital assets with indefinite useful lives, intangible capital assets, uh, infrastructure accounted for using the modified approach. And we'll give it a second to get some answers. So it looks like most people got the correct answer, um, intangible capital assets. Okay. I don't know, Thanks, I don't know anyone who uses the modified approach at all. Have you ever run across it, Lindsay? I have not. Yep. The next time will be the first time. <laughs> so thanks for participating in the, uh, in the poll. We have two more exciting ones uh, coming up, so. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, now we're gonna talk about the capitalizable costs. So these are the costs of an asset that are gonna be included in the value of the asset we are capitalizing. <laughs> First, we have acquisition costs, which are the costs to purchase or construct the asset. Next, we have ancillary charges, which are the costs necessary to place this asset into its intended location and condition for use. So an example of this would be like professional services. So just make sure that the types of ancillary costs to be capitalized, again, are defined in your capital asset policy. We keep going back to the importance of that capital asset policy. Um, next, we have interest, which is actually changed with GASB 89. So going forward, no longer capitalizing interest, um, but in the past we had. And then lastly, the application of internal resources, which can be direct or indirect. So how do we determine the capitalizable costs for internally generated capital assets? Fairly uncommon, but I do work with one client who does um, capitalize some of these intangible costs on an annual basis. So in order to capitalize costs for internally generated assets, all of the following criteria must be met. Um, the specific objective of the project has been determined. The nature of the service capacity to be provided has been determined. The feasibility of successfully completing the project has been demonstrated and the government has demonstrated that it intends, is able to, and is making an effort to develop and complete the project. Again, fairly uncommon and we only generally see, you know, pretty large units of government that are, you know, developing their own software. So I won't go over this slide in too much detail. Um, however, this slide does detail out the various stages of computer software development describes the related activities and tells us whether or not that these costs can be capitalized. So the preliminary project stage itself is not capitalizable. The application development stage, which includes coding, installation, data conversion, and testing can be capitalized if incurred after completing of the preliminary project stage. And then the last stage, post-implementation stage, is not capitalized as this includes items such as you know, training and software maintenance. So again, this slide relates to internally generated computer software. <clears throat> One common question we get, you know, pretty often is how do we determine if something is an improvement to be capitalized versus, you know, a repair that should be expensed? So improvements increase the asset's service capacity or extend the asset's useful life. Um, and that and those improvements are what are going to be capitalized, those that extend the useful life. So this is in contrast to maintenance and repairs. Maintenance and repairs preserve your service capacity or useful life, but do not extend them. So maintenance and repairs are expensed when incurred and not capitalized. Your capital asset policy should define, you know, what is considered to be a replacement, a repair and maintenance versus what is an improvement or betterment that will be capitalized. So again, just make sure this is defined in your policy 
and you're consistently applying your government's methodology. Um, next slide is on valuation. So valuation, it's kind of a debated topic because unlike in the private sector, some of our government's assets can go back hundreds of years and valuing them can be challenging. <clears throat> the primary principle we have today is that we have historical costs to account for our capital assets. If historical cost is not available, we use some estimate of historical costs. We can use a standard costing methodology where we determine the cost of a comparable asset in the same time frame and then use that as an estimate of cost. Or what we see more commonly is normal costing where the current or replacement cost of the asset is determined in today's dollar. And then we backtrend that using an index to estimate the historical cost of the asset when it was acquired. As discussed before, donated capital assets, including infrastructure put in by a developer or were donated by the government are now reported at acquisition value um, per GASB statement 72 basically estimated fair value, but we just don't call it fair value. We discussed depreciation briefly when we were talking about the capital asset policies. Um, we generally depreciate capital assets, again, unless you're using that modified approach under statement 34, which as Jim and I had just kind of said, is, is really uncommon. We haven't seen that before. So what is depreciation? Depreciation is the method, method of allocating the cost of using a capital asset over its estimated useful life. <clears throat> Do we depreciate all capital assets? Um, I think we just had that polling question. The answer is no, we don't depreciate all assets. So land is not depreciated since that has an indefinite useful life. Construction and process is not depreciated until the asset is placed into service. <clears throat> and I guess we technically don't depreciate intangible assets, but we do amortize them over their estimated useful life. So there's a few methods of depreciation, but I guess the first question to ask before we start about methods is when do we start depreciating an asset? Do you give a full year of depreciation in the first year? Do you do no depreciation in the first year and a full year of depreciation in the last year? You could depreciate it based upon the actual months in the service, months in service, or you could depreciate it, you know, half year. So there are a lot of options, right? So again, making sure that your capitalization policy um, addresses when depreciation starts on your assets is also a crucial component. So back to the methods of depreciation. The most common method that we've seen is the straight line method. So allocating essentially the same amount of depreciation each year over the estimated useful life of the asset. There is the activity method. So you're allocating an amount of expense proportionate to the service value um, exhausted each period. So an example of this would be like if you had a car um, and you would basically depreciate it based upon the mileage per year that are used on that car. Uh, the last option is allocate increasingly smaller amounts of expense over time to compensate for increased maintenance expense on older assets, for example, like the declining charge method. So again, any of these are allowable, but just ensuring that whatever you choose is documented in your capital asset policy. Estimating useful lives is also a key component in our industry. So it should be established considering the assets um, quality, application, the environment in which the asset will be used, your government's maintenance and replacement policy, and your government's experience with similar assets. Salvage value is the asset's residual value at the end of its useful life. So I would say most governments assume this to be zero, but if you do estimate a salvage value, um, just remember that this will affect the calculation of depreciation. You also may depreciate assets individually or similar assets as a group. If group depreciation is used, just ensure items in the group need to have the same useful life and generally the same acquisition date. And that brings us to polling question number two. What is your government's capitalization threshold? 1,000 to 4,999, 5,000 to 999, 9,999. 10,000 to 24,999, 25,000 plus, no right answer. Shout out to Lindsay too for uh, coming up with the uh, polling questions. You know, I didn't even give an option for under a thousand, but for I'm everyone's sake, creative. I hope most of yours are uh, above are, are above a thousand. <laughs> Looks like the majority is between 5,000 and 10,000, about 43%. Cool, got 89% voted. All right. I'm gonna take out over starting 
uh, and talking about Gasby's statement 83. Uh, I quick update on my puppy though. We have a camera on her in the <clears throat> in the family room, uh, so she's currently sleeping on the couch, or he's currently sleeping on the couch. So uh, should be uh, should be good to go here. Um, also, I'll apologize in advance too. I'm I'm coming over uh, overcoming a flu or some type of virus too, so I may put myself on mute to, so you guys don't have to hear me cough every once in a while. So um, I apologize for that. So uh, I will start off, um, like I said, talking about uh, asset retirement obligations or AROs, uh, GASBY Statement 83. Uh, so this came out, it's been a few years now. I think it was effective for periods beginning June 30th or periods ending June 30th, 2019 and thereafter. So it's been around for about five years. So. In Illinois, at least, it didn't have a huge impact. Uh, we'll see in a minute. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, was affected by asset retirement obligations, but pretty much not not a big impact. Um, so this could be a legally enforceable uh, liability associated with the retirement of a tangible capital asset. So it's going to be the permanent removal of a capital asset from service. And you can see some of the um, some of the examples here uh, that are in GASB 83, uh, the one that's probably becoming more relevant because of the age of some of the nuclear power plants that are you know, probably 50 plus years old now is decommissioning those plants, which is gonna be a significant amount of money. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So in the initial recognition uh, of the liability, you're going to record the ARO liability and then an offsetting deferred outflow of resource. So those amounts should equal each other. Um, you're going to record it um, when it's incurred and then reasonably estimable, or you can estimate the amount. Um, incurrence um, involves both external and internal obligating events. So external obligating events, is there's going to be some legal requirement to be able to do it, to, to have to do it. So a federal, state, or local law or regulation, a legally binding contract, a court judgment, something like that is going to be the uh, external um, uh, event. The uh, internal obligating events, for the most part, it's when the asset's placed in service. That's going to be the internal obligating event. There are some uh, I believe contamination related AROs that it's the, when it becomes contaminated is when you um, recognize it. Um, but otherwise it's pretty much when you place it in service. Um, and it's measured based on the best estimate of the current value of outlay is expected to be incurred. So that's the initial recognition uh, and the subsequent recognition, at least annually, you're supposed to adjust it for inflation or deflation. Uh, a lot of times it's probably not material, so you, it may not be something that you're you're going to adjust um, each year. And then evaluate um, whether there's any significant changes in the estimate of the outlays. Uh, and if so, you'd want to remeasure the liability uh, and the related deferred outflow of resource. And then for that deferred outflow of resource, you're going to amortize that in a systematic and rational manner over the estimated useful life of the capital asset. So when all of us see systematic and rational manner, 99.9% uh, .9 of us uh, basically say, okay, straight line over the life of the asset. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so the effects uh, of funding and assurance, um, if you're legally required to provide funding and assurance, you have to disclose that fact. Um, if you've set aside any assets that are restricted for the payment of the ARO, you don't want to offset that against the uh, ARO itself. And then any cost to comply uh, with funding and assurance provisions uh, are basically just period costs separate from the ARO expense. So you just record that as a uh, outflow of resource um, in the period that it was incurred. Next slide. And like with, with all good uh, GASB pronouncements, there's always got to be some disclosures. Uh, so you can see the disclosures required here, a general description of the ARO and then the associated tangible capital asset, um, why it's legal, legally required um, to uh, retire that asset, 
um, whether, like I said, whether it's laws, regulations, contracts, or a court judgment. Uh, methods uh, and assumptions used to measure the ARO liability, uh, the remaining useful life of the tangible capital asset. Um, if there's any financial assurance requirements, how they're being met. Um, amount of assets restricted for payment of ARO liabilities, if you can't uh, discern that from the financial statements. And then if you can't estimate the ARO, you have to disclose that uh, it's not estimated uh, and the reason why you can't estimate it. So next slide. And like I said, in Illinois, for the most part, water wells have been the one item where there is a, a retirement obligation where those wells have to be uh, filled and capped. Um, so, and that's a significant amount of money. Uh, I think typically 50,000 to 100,000 for each well. And a lot of governments have multiple wells uh, in their system. So it can be a, a decent amount of money. That's been the main one uh, in special districts you know, outdoor pools, other site restoration, you may have some issues. Um, the one other item we noted when we implemented was uh, underground like fuel storage tanks, which some, uh, some governments do have. However, we found in most instances, those amounts were pretty immaterial. Um, I think the cost to retire those, usually like 10,000 to 30,000 range. So for most uh, governments, not material, so they typically weren't recorded. Next slide. All right, so Lindsay went over 87 and 96. That's kind of what I'm gonna go over now um, in a little more detail. Um, so we've kind of gone through this slide. Uh, like Lindsay said, we implemented back in June 30th, 2022 uh, and thereafter. So we've been about almost two years into this now. Um, so, and, and a lot of a lot of our clients, it's uh, the second year uh, of accounting under GASB Statement 87. So we've got a little bit a uh, little bit uh, under our belt. Um, so this is obviously 87 and 96, everyone's favorite subject lately, uh, or at least until GASB 101 is effective in a couple months. So and I'm being facetious, um, but <clears throat> we can uh, move to the next slide. Now. 96. Yeah, I think that's the one, right? Is that the next one, Lindsay? Yeah, did you want to flip forward to 96 or are we going to go over 87 and more? Uh, yeah, go, go to, yeah, 33, I think. Let's see here. There you go. Yep, that's it. So we're kind of, like I said, we've, we've almost gone through two years of this, so we know kind of know the definition, but a, a lease is a contract that conveys the uh, control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset for a period of time in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Uh, the one thing that I will, um, kind of emphasize here too, is that exchange or exchange-like transaction. There can be um, certain leases, especially between governments where they may lease out a building or building space or land for like a dollar a year. So that's obviously doesn't meet the definition of an exchange or exchange-like transaction and can be scoped out of uh, 87. The right to use asset, it's going to be specified in the contract and then controls manifested by the right to obtain present service capacity uh, from the underlying asset and the right to determine the nature and manner of use of the underlying asset. <clears throat> you can go to the next slide, Lindsay. <clears throat> so for initial reporting, and I'll kind of uh, focus on the lessee side since we're talking about capital assets. But so for the, the lease liability, it's gonna be the present value of future lease payments. So that's gonna include the fixed payments, uh, variable payments based on an index or rate, uh, variable payments that are basically fixed in nature. 
and then other um, residual guarantees. So that's the liability. The uh, intangible right to use asset is going to, you're going to start off with that lease liability number and then add in any prepayments and any direct costs that were ancillary to placing the asset in use. On the lessor side, like I said, I'll, I'll focus on capital assets, but the lessor side, since you're leasing out the capital asset, you're going to continue to report that capital asset on your financial statements. <clears throat> and uh, so you're going to continue to report that asset as well as uh, continue to depreciate it. Next slide. So for subsequent reporting um, on the asset side, you're going to amortize <clears throat> the intangible lease asset over the shorter of the either the useful life of the asset itself or the lease term. And then the liability, you're going to treat it just like any other debt and debt service. You're going to reduce uh, the lease payments, it's going to re reduce the liability by the lease payments, less than amount, obviously, that you're going to record as interest expense. So that portion um, related to interest, you need to record that separately. And then, like I said, on the lessor side, you're going to continue to depreciate that leased asset um, with a couple of exception, exceptions. Obviously, if it's uh, an asset with an indefinite useful life like land, you're not going to obviously depreciate that. Or if they're required to return it to you in its original or, in, or in an enhanced condition, you also wouldn't need to depreciate it either. Next slide. All right, and this also a slide that Lindsay went over previously for GASB 96, uh, the what, why, and when. So as Lindsay said, we kind of just started to implement 96. Um, so we've, we've gotten a little bit of, um, kind of a little bit of experience or a little history so far, <clears throat> and I'm kind of generalizing here, so I don't want to say this applies to everybody, but generally what we've kind of found out is there, for most clients, there may be actually more agreements to analyze, uh, under GASB statement 96 than there were under GASB 87. For leases. However, we found most are usually scoped out, um, either due to the short-term nature of the uh, of the SPIDA or it's immaterial, um, or it, it may be a service contract or a maintenance contract only. So we usually start off with a lot more uh, agreements to look at, but most of them get whittled down where you just have like a small handful left to record, if, it, if anything. So um, the one thing that that is easier under 96 uh, as opposed to uh, GASB 87 with leases is you don't have to look at any agreements from like 1960, which we actually had to do for leases. There were some leases out there that that literally dated back like 60 plus years. So the good thing about SPIDAs is, is um, hopefully no client's going to have a, a, a SPIDA from 1960. Um, but uh, Typically, they're going to be three to five years in length, so it's it they're fairly short term. You don't have to go back a long time to try to uh, find all of the spittas. It's just that there might be quite a few of them. So completeness uh, and determining completeness um, is still still going to be an issue, and it's it still does take some work. Um, but uh, it it does seem to be uh, a little bit easier than than GASB 87. So. <clears throat> one thing too I'll note before we move on to the next slide, actually you can move on, that's fine, Lindsay, um, is um, one thing we run across, if you're paying for information like Morningstar, uh, Bloomberg News, things like that, where actually you're paying for the content itself, um, that wouldn't fall under 96 because you're not paying for uh, software to use software. It, they may have some software, but you're just using that as a tool to to access the information that you want. So you're paying in those instances for information, not for a subscription license. So so I want to point that out real quick. So 
a lot of this, like Yogi Berra said, is uh, deja vu all over again. This is a lot of this stuff is really similar to 87. So it, in that aspect too, it's been easier to implement. Um, but you're basically going to create an intangible asset, a right to use um, subscription software, um, along with the related subscription liability. <clears throat> you're also, um, and this is similar to GASB 51 that uh, Lindsay went over as well. Um, but uh, you're going to have some capitalization criteria for outlays other than subscription payments. So you may have those, you'll have the subscription payments, but there may be some capitalizable implementation costs that you can also <clears throat> add as well to the subscription asset. And then obviously requires some note disclosures for the uh, SPIDAs as well. Apologize, I had to cough a little bit there. So you can see the uh, definitions pretty similar. Contracts that convey the right to use another party's IT software. Um, it can be a loan or it can be in combination with tangible capital assets as well, um, like hardware. Uh, and again, has to be an exchange or exchange-like transaction. Uh, right to use the underlying asset means the government can uh, obtain present service capacity um, and determine the nature and manner of use of the underlying IT assets. So very similar to 87. Uh, SPIDAs that exclude uh, contracts, uh, exclude contracts solely for IT support services or like maintenance agreements, those would be excluded uh, from GASB 96. And then the last bullet point there too you may have uh instances where the contract may have both the right to use asset but it also may have support service component as well so hopefully you can break those out by component and exclude the support service amount and just include the uh the right to use portion uh when you're recording the asset and the liability next slide And there's a few exclusions under GASB 96. The first one is when you've got uh, tangible capital assets that meet the definition of 87. Uh, and they may have like a software component, but it's insignificant uh, to the overall um, lease. So the, the, the common example here is uh, if you're leasing a, a laptop computer, um, you're paying for the computer, the, the operating system software that comes with it is insignificant. So you want to treat that under GASB statement 87. Uh, there's no kind of like lessor equivalent uh, to GASB 96. So if a government's um, letting another entity use their software, you don't have to account for it. Uh, like I said, like on the lessee, lessor type side. Um, any contracts that meet the definition of a, a P3 under paragraph five of statement 94 is also excluded. And then anything that is a perpetual license uh, would be accounted for under GASB 51 that Lindsay uh, covered previously. <clears throat> the one thing I'll point out here too though, um, and this is a, this was an implementation guide question. Uh, it's uh, the codifications S80 dot 701-1, but um, automatic uh, software agreements that have automatic renewals are not considered perpetual licenses. So I just want to point that out because that's a, a provides a little bit of a confusion um, out there. Next slide. So these are also very similar. Uh, you're trying to determine the subscription term uh, in, the, in the period. These are all very similar um, to GASB Statement 87. So options to extend, options to terminate, uh, both for the, for the government as well as the SPIDA vendor, uh, determining what you're going to include um, in, the, uh, in the period. One thing I'll point out here too, just to emphasize, is it has to be reasonably certain. And that in practice, uh, 
from from my experience and, and talking with others is a pretty high bar. So reasonably certain, it means it pretty much is going to happen. Um, it's got to be, you know, probably a close to 90% certainty that you're going to either exercise the option or not exercise a termination option. So I just want to point that out that that's a pretty high bar. If you're not meeting that bar, you shouldn't include those um, option periods when you're determining the, the length of the, uh, of the SPIDA. You can move to the next slide. So a short-term uh, SPIDA is uh, at the commencement uh, of the su subscription term has a maximum possible term of 12 months or less. Uh, that includes any options to expend, extend regardless of the probability of it being exercised. So it doesn't matter the probability in this case when you're trying to figure out if it's 12 months or longer. And then an important point is that second bullet point indented bullet point periods for which both the government and the spit of vendor have an option to terminate the spit without permission from the other party uh, or if both parties have agree, have to agree to extend it are cancelable periods and should be excluded from the maximum possible term so you don't include any of those has to be without cause though so it can't be um, a case where uh, uh, one of the one of the two uh, parties defaulted um, on the on the agreement that's not without cause or without permission so defaults uh, aren't included when you're trying to determine this <clears throat> um, for cancelable periods such as rolling month to month year to year uh, maximum possible term of the spit is the non cancelable period um, including any notice period so there may be instances where you, it may be a short-term uh, spit up but if for whatever reason, there's a notice period that's greater than 12 months, then you may still have to include it um, as a uh, as a SPIDA. So the notice period, maybe 12 months, 18 months or something like that, that would uh, then cause it to fall under 96. <clears throat> and then short term SPIDA is it's basically an outflow in the period. So it's an expense expenditure in the period incurred. So no. No intangible asset or subscription liability is recognized. So how to account for it? Uh, on the accrual basis, economic resources measurement focus, uh, recognize a subscription liability, uh, an intangible right to use asset at the commencement of the subscription term. So you don't record anything until it actually commences. And then you're going to record this subscription liability, the present value of payments uh, expected to be made during the subscription term. Uh, so all the fixed payments, variable payments, depending on index or rate, uh, variable payments that are uh, fixed in substance, adjust it for any incentives receivable from the vendor. Um, and then any other payments to the vendor um, that are reasonably certain of being required to be made based on the assessment of all relevant factors. So that's kind of like the catch-all right there. Um, so any any other payments that you need to include. And then you want to discount the liability uh, using the interest rate that the vendor charges the government if you can figure that out. So good luck with that. Next slide. So the asset, you're going to, similar to 87, you're going to start with the subscription liability and then add any payments uh, to the vendor at the commencement of the subscription uh, payment term, and then any capitalized initial implementation costs, which we'll talk about in a second, and it will look eerily like one of the slides that Lindsay went over. So the asset would be amortized in a systematic and rational manner over the shorter of the term or the uh, subscription term or the useful life of the underlying IT asset. So again, very similar to, to 87. The amortization report has an outflow of resource, amortization expense, uh, and it can be combined with depreciation expense um, for financial reporting purposes. <clears throat> 
And then again, amortization begins at the commencement of the subscription term. So nothing happens till the, till the commencement. You can move to slide 44. Boy, this looks awful familiar. So I won't spend too much time on this one, but this is very similar to GASB 51. So basically, the only thing you're going to capitalize is going to be that second stage, the app application development stage. So in the preliminary project stage, you're determining feasibility, what path you want to go down. All that should just be expensed in the period. Once you've figured out the, cho the chosen path um, and you start down there with coding, installation, uh, hardware, data conversion, <coughs> excuse me, that part, the implementation, you want to uh, capitalize most of that, um, but it's got to be uh, incurred um, after completion of the preliminary project stage. Now, operation and additional implementation, uh, application training, troubleshooting, uh, data conversion, software maintenance, generally, for the most part, that's not going to be capitalized. There are a few instances if it increases functionality or efficiency uh other modules you may capitalize those amounts but for the most part you're not going to next slide i see we're probably running out of time too so i'll try to speed up um so that was on the uh uh economic resources measurement focus so for the current financial resources measurement focus uh you're going to record an expenditure and an other financing source in an equal amount um then you record that uh, in the period the uh, subscription asset is initially recognized. And then basically the payments on the subscription you're gonna treat just like any other debt service payment, um, no, no different from that. So next slide. And then the disclosures, uh, I won't go through these uh, because we are running out of time, but uh, basically same disclosures as 87. So what we'll do now for the rest of the presentation is go over just some uh, examples of reporting capital assets um, in, the, in your financial statement. So starting with the statement of net position, uh, depreciable, non-depreciable assets uh, should not be reported on the same line. Um, net position, as you know, there's three categories, net investment and capital assets or NICA, restricted and then unrestricted. So Couple of points on the net investment and in capital assets. You're going to include tangible and intangible assets. You want to include both of them. Uh, any unspent resources accumulated for capital assets are excluded. This is basically bond proceeds that haven't been spent yet. You want to add those amounts back. Um, and then equity interest and joint ventures should not be excluded. So it's capital, it's net capital assets. Um, less debt that was used to create those assets, including any uh, capital assets that are in accounts payable or retainage payable, um, and then adding back any unspent bond proceeds. And then there's some other plus uh, additions and subtractions uh, that we won't go through uh, right now. So the next slide just gives you an example of a statement of net position from Fox Valley Park District, I believe. Hey, Jim, really quickly, um, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and launch the third poll question just so we can make sure we can. Yeah, no, get sounds it good. The top of the hour. Which of the following is not required to be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements? Oh, good question, Lindsay. Hopefully like you know the answer, are, Jim. <laughs> looks like most people are getting it right. Proceeds from the sale of capital assets. Great questions, Lindsay. So that looks good. I think we can close that out. <clears throat> I'll talk extremely fast. So here's an example of the statement of net position. Um, you'll see 
uh, about two thirds of the way the capital assets not being depreciated and then capital assets and intangible capital assets that are being depreciated and amortized. So those are broken out separately um, like they're supposed to. Uh, next slide. And then here's the liability deferred inflow and net position section of the statement of net position. And you'll know the lease liabilities, the spit of liabilities, they're all going to be included in the non-current liabilities there up at the top, due within one year and due uh, in more than one year. And then you'll see the net position, uh, net investment and capital assets uh, is recorded there, along with, like I said, restricted and unrestricted amounts. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> so on the statement of activities, we don't show depreciation and amortization uh, separately. They're allocated out by function or program. Um, so you've got to be able to track that uh, by function or program in order to record it on your financial statements. So next slide. So here's the statement of activities and you'll see uh, Fox Valley has two functions, general government um, and recreation. Um, so you'll see that the, and the expense, that very first column, uh, the depreciation expense is going to be included in there. And you'll see how it's allocated in the footnotes when we get to that in one second. Next slide. So notes to the financial statements. The This is usually in the summary of significant accounting policies. Uh, you want to describe the government's policy for capitalizing assets and related thresholds, uh, estimating the useful lives, uh, and the method used to calculate depreciation expense. Next slide. So you can see the example here. Um, you can see they had a threshold of 5,000 for all of their capital assets. You could have different thresholds based on different capital asset types. Uh, that's not uh, uh, uncommon to see. In a life of one year, um, you can see also uh, in that last paragraph, they're using the straight line method of depreciation and they're depreciating it over those uh, lives noted there. Uh, and then also there's a, another uh, intangible asset footnote for 87 and 96. Right <laughs> next question or next slide. Uh, detailed note disclosures. Uh, and I think Lindsay went over this a little bit, but for each major asset class, beginning balance, acquisitions, disposals, uh, any transfers or reclassifications. Then you come to an ending balance uh, request reported separately for governmental and business type activities <clears throat> and then separate capital assets being depreciated from not being depreciated as we've as we've seen already next slide and like i said depreciation expense should be by function you can go to the next slide So it's an example of the capital assets. You can see the beginning balances increases. They did have transfers during the year. This isn't always something that occurs. Then decreases and then ending balance. And you can see it's broken out by not being depreciated, then tangible being depreciated and intangible uh, being amortized. Next slide. And then here's the footnote of the depreciation by function. So you can see depreciation by function and then amortization by function as well. And we already did the polling question ahead of the game. Last thing I wanted to point out real quick and we'll wrap up and I apologize for going over. Um, there was an exposure draft that came out last fall uh, related to disclosure and classification of certain capital assets. Comments were due at the beginning of this year, and then a final statement's expected in the third quarter of 2024. Uh, next slide. This creates basically a, a separate, a new category, as you can see, capital assets held for sale, shown by major asset class. They want you to uh, show leased assets by major asset class, then SPIDAs as a separate line item. And then intangible assets other than leases or spittas by major asset class. And this capital asset held for sale is, uh, a, if the government's decided to sell an asset and it's probable that the sale will be finalized within a year, you should uh, 
show that separately in the footnotes. Probable is somewhere between more likely than not, which is like 51%, and reasonably certain, as we've talked about, is like 90%. So somewhere in between. So it's probably going to happen, like two out of three chance of happening. Uh, that's kind of what um, probable means. And if you want to move to the next slide, this is a should be Appendix C. Yep, Appendix C. This is a good example in the exposure draft um, of how you show things. So you can see. Um, I got to put my cheaters on for this. Um, held for sale buildings, you'll notice. Uh, and then intangible assets software, that very first line, that's going to be purchase software. Uh, subscription assets are right to use um, software that's down below. Other right to use assets, which may be uh, under operators, uh, under GASB Statement 94, that could be a right to use asset there. And then leased assets by major asset type buildings. So you can see they're leasing buildings and equipment. Same category for accumulated depreciation. So that is all I have. I apologize for running uh, about five minutes over, but I, uh, we do thank you a lot for your time. Um, if you do have questions, um, there's Lindsay and uh, I's Um, contact information. You can see me with my cheaters on. But it's a rare sight. I'm rarely seen in the wild with glasses. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, any questions or anything, let us know. I know we did have some questions in the, I think in the chat box, and we can get uh, answers to those as well. But uh, that should do it for today. Chelsea, I don't know if there's anything else we need to go over. We are all set. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks everyone for your time. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>